thank you for joining another episode of Ketonian Corner. I'm Jolene Hale, and I'm here with my co-host, John Davidson. Hello, hello. So today, I am pretty stoked. We announced in our last podcast that we were going to do this interview, and I am fan-geeking all over the place. I am beyond excited. This is somebody that I have wanted to talk to for a very long time. So uh, one of my first introductions to uh, keto was watching this fat head the movie and so we are blessed to be able to interview tom naughton and he is the creator of the documentary hello tom thank you for joining us i'm happy to be here so what got you started to do this documentary i'm sure you get asked this a million times but um were you were you eating ketogenic when you did this or were you eating a fad diet uh, no, actually, uh, neither. Um, I was on what I thought was a pretty good diet. I mean, in retrospect, it wasn't, I guess we can come back to that, <laughs> but actually I didn't set out to make what fathead ultimately became. I was living in LA at the time. And like a lot of people with writing and acting ambitions, I was going different auditions, whatever. I finally decided, you know, I'm just going to sit down and make something that I want to make, shoot my own show and see what happens. And the idea I had was for a show I was going to call In Defense of Common Sense, which is common sense, but kind of funny guy looks at issues of the day. The topic I chose for what I thought would be my pilot episode was on how we treat fat people in American society. One of the few groups left were that you're allowed to be uh, actually quite bigoted towards and get away with it. And I just started researching the subject. I ended up watching Super Size Me, which I hadn't previously seen. Super Size Me was entertaining, but there was so much BS in it. You know, I was jumping off the couch and yelling at the TV. And I decided, you know what? I need to do a reply to this this thing, which is, as you know, you've seen Fathead. People have said it's almost like two short movies put together. And part one is really kind of what's wrong with Super Size Me. That's where I started. But then in the course of researching what is a good diet, if I'm going to go on a fast food diet, I should know what I'm getting into. That's when I started realizing how much of the standard dietary advice is just flat out wrong, which, as you know, kind of became the theme of the, the second half of Fathead. Yeah. So yeah. Just, just to kind of back up a little bit, because you, you, kind of, you know, kind of just jumped right to the movie. So, but your background, why, why were you in L.A.? What, what was your career? You were just an actor, cause, or were you doing other stuff also? So I spent most of my 30s as a stand-up comedian living on the road. And then you get to a certain point, you're working the clubs, you're working cruise ships, what's next? You know, what's the next higher level? Well, it's breaking into television. So I moved out to LA to attempt to do that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just still kind of getting this through my head. That, that's amazing. You, you know, you go from being a stand-up comedian to end up, uh, write, you know, writing and producing a, a huge documentary. That's, that's quite the swing. Did you, were you pretty challenged with that or it just kind of flowed one thing to the next and pretty soon that's oh, where you I ended was, up? Uh, no, I was, I was very challenged and, you know, I go through those, would go through those moments. I think everybody does where I'm looking at the idea of I'm going to make a documentary and then thinking, are you nuts? You don't know how to make a documentary. Uh, what worked out really well for me is that my wife's sister actually had produced documentaries. In fact, she produced an award-winning documentary called out of the shadow about schizophrenia. And we lived in L.A. at the time. She lived in L.A. So I had her around to pick her brain. So even though I had no idea what I was doing, I'd never shot anything like that before. I at least had her as a resource, kind of a, uh, you know, to kind of shepherd me through the process. And I still made some mistakes. But, you know, there was a lot of stuff I had to dump because I just flat out did it wrong. But, uh, you know, through trial and error, I eventually got it there. So starting out, Fathead, you said that you weren't really um, eating standard American or the ketogenic diet. So did you, what were your thoughts on like the ADA, the A, the AHA, and the USDA uh, dietary guidelines? And how's that different from after you did all of that research? 
Yeah, the reason I say I wasn't on a standard American diet is really what I'd call a standard American diet is got way more sugar in it than I was eating. I mean, I already knew that sugar was bad and I really haven't been much of a sugar eater since probably my early teens. Uh, but I was on what I thought was a good diet in terms of, you know, lots of good, healthy whole grains and kind of limiting the fat and not eating very much meat. I went through a period where I was actually a vegetarian. I thought that was a good diet. And it really was not until I started researching fathead that I realized how much of that advice was, was wrong. I was, uh, in, in, before my stand up days, I was actually a writer for a magazine called family safety and health. And I'm sorry to say somewhere in their archives, there are articles written by me promoting the low fat, high grain diet, because this was the eighties and that's what we were all told was good for us. And I didn't know any better. So if we fast forward to now, um, if somebody like uh, took a look at your Twitter or your, your website, um, you, you seem to be really keeping up with all the studies. So do you actually build that into your work week or is it just a hobby I, for you? I do now. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to Twitter feeds from people who tend to put a lot of that information out there. Um, I go looking, and when I come across a new study, I, I actually finally start keeping studies in a uh, – at first I had them in a database, and now I keep them in OneNote because it's easy to search. And once I became fascinated with this topic, then I, I start keeping pretty good records on what's out there and studies that I find interesting. When I come across a new one, I'll pull it down, I'll analyze it, I'll see if there's, there's something there. So if you don't mind, just like kind of dive into one for an example. So in the last uh, like month or so, you, you kind of took on, for lack of a better term, the, the all meat or the carnivore diet. So yeah. that, you, you had a pretty amazing write up where you had took feedback from somebody on Facebook who, you know, and uh, it looked at different studies. And to me, it looked like it was well, I guess, uh, thought, thought through and looked at you know, all the studies have been read. So about how much time do you, how does it take to do a summary like that? It can vary quite a bit for how much time I put into a post. I mean, some of them are opinion pieces that I can knock out in a couple hours. The one that I think you're referring to, that was probably more of a, you know, that probably took me the better part of the day. Gotcha. So with all of that, um, you already kind of mentioned a little bit about uh, changing <laughs> your mindset because you mentioned before along, you know, 20 years ago or something, you had uh, mentioned low fat. So if you had come across some research and it, and it looked kind of interesting, but it didn't quite collide with what you're thinking, uh, how, how, you know, how, uh, I guess, uh, willing are you to change your opinions based on research? I try to stay open-minded uh, even now, and I, I remind myself, because I see people, and I'm sure you see this, when it comes to diet, they kind of break into camps. It's almost like religion for some people, where this is what I believe, and this is what I'm always going to believe, and I don't want to hear any contrary evidence. Well, I keep reminding myself that I used to have beliefs about diet that were wrong. Like I said, back in the 80s, I was one of the people writing articles telling people, eat your grains and follow the food pyramid and limit your fat. And the reason I changed my mind about that was that evidence convinced me I was wrong. And I try to stay open minded now. I have a set of beliefs now. And I remind myself, you changed your mind before and you have to be willing to change your mind again if the evidence tells you that you're wrong. We all have a tendency to want to get comfortable with our beliefs and not be challenged and not have to change them. But I think that's something we all have to guard against because we should never assume, hey, I know it all now. I don't, I don't have to keep thinking or keep considering the evidence. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's really easy to say that. It's really hard. Uh, I think I've been challenged a little bit. And, and actually that all meat, all meat diet was a great example. Um, we, I, I, I've read enough about it recently. There's some people that really swear by it. And if it works for them, I mean, obviously that's fantastic for them. But it's, it's, it's really challenged the fact that um, I, I, I like dark leafy greens and I, 
really work on making sure I get those in my diet. And sometimes I'm like, well, wh why do I feel that way? And should I look at the other side? So I really appreciated your, your article and kind of looking at, you seem to take a good stance at both the pros and cons for the particular topic. Well, I certainly tried to. And to be clear, I'm not telling people you shouldn't go on an all meat diet. Like you say, there are some people who swear by it. And maybe that's their genetics. Maybe it's a matter of given the metabolic state that they're in now, maybe because of a bad diet earlier in life, maybe that just happens to work for them now. So for the people who say, but I'm on an all meat diet and I feel great. Hey, that's fine. Keep doing it. What I was disputing in that post was this belief that some people have that an all meat diet is the natural diet for humans and that adding any kind of plant food is somehow unnatural and damages your health. And humans only start doing that after agriculture came along. And to me, the evidence is very clear that humans have pretty much always eaten some combination of plant foods and animal foods. So that was the argument that I was making and trying to support with evidence that yes, human beings are omnivores. So on your on your Twitter, I mean, I I don't follow you on Twitter, but I do follow you pretty closely on Facebook. Um, so you are pretty active in those groups uh, yourself, where a lot of people sometimes have admins doing things for them. But like with the naysayers, um, when when they come to you, and I mean, we all get negative flack for all of our beliefs. I think we've all dealt with all of that, but. How do you deal with it? Do you just present the the research um, links, or do you do you just? I mean, how do you deal with all of the negativity? It it depends. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard the saying: "You can't reason a man out of a position he didn't reason himself into." So we get, as I'm, you know, anybody who has a blog or anything dedicated to paleo or low carb or whatever, you're going to get what my brother came up with this term. I love it. The vegetrolians. <laughs> you're going to get the people who show up. And for them, I mean, really, for a lot of them, it is akin to a hardcore religious belief. Eating meat is bad. It's going to kill you. I think for them, it's kind of a substitute religion. Eating meat is the sin. And I... I have kind of given up on trying to have a logical argument with people like that because logic bounces off their brains like little rubber bullets. It has no effect. So there are people like that who essentially they're happy to waste your time. They're happy to come back and argue and argue and argue and argue endlessly. And you have to realize it's pointless because I know they're wrong. I also know they will never be convinced they're wrong. So for people like that, I just kind of let it go. Now, if people come in and they want to argue and I think they're open minded or they're arguing because they have some disagreements with me, but they seem like maybe they're open to um, having their minds changed. Yeah, I'll, I'll provide the links. I'll provide the research. Uh, and sometimes people come in and argue a point, and guess what? After I look at it, I realize they're the ones who are right. That gets back to staying open minded. So it kind of depends. Do I think this person really wants to have a discussion or do I think this person is preaching at me? If it's someone preaching at me, I'm not going to waste my time. Nice. So, so on, on that same topic, you said you just kind of very quickly said, I just let it go. But doesn't doesn't all that negative kind of, I guess, what you call it, vegetarians, don't, don't they ever get on your nerves so much that you just wanted to quit, but you seem to kind of just no. fight through it? No, no, they, it's, they've never made me want to quit. What I finally did was, because they, they always come back with the same arguments. They, they quote the same highly cherry-picked epidemiological studies. It's the same arguments that they've heard from people like Furman and... You know, they've read the China study and stuff like that. I've never seen a new argument from these people since I started doing this. So what I finally did was I wrote a long post called to the vegetarian evangelists where I just deal with all their arguments and explain why I don't find them convincing. And I put that on the blog. And now when one of them shows up making the same arguments, I just say, yep, go read this blog post. 
If you have an argument that's brand new that I didn't cover in here, you can come back to me. And they never come back to me because they'd never have a new argument. <laughs> so, I like it. Just, you just cracked lay, me just up. Lay the dirt, just lay that dirty, dirty laundry right out there. That's right. <laughs> um, so what do you have coming up? Do you still do um, speaking events on this? Um, I know you've you've been a participant in the low carb cruise in the past, but do you have anything like that? KetoCon 2018. I, what's on the schedule for now? I mean, I'm not going out and giving a speech every week. It's it's not uh, it's not a huge part of my life, but I am going to be on the low carb cruise again this year. Um, I go on that because I enjoy giving the speeches. I also just enjoy being with a group of whatever it turns out to be, 200, sometimes 300 people, where you don't have to explain them over dinner why you're not eating the bread, and they're a great (laughs) group of people to hang out with. A lot of the lectures are really enjoyable. Jimmy always gets in some interesting doctors and researchers, and, you know, I go and give my speech, but I I also always come away with – you know, some new bit of knowledge that I learned from watching the other speeches. But I'm going on that. I was just invited to give the keynote address at the Weston A conference, uh, Weston A price conference in November. So I'll be doing that. And then uh, Ooh, other than that, it's, you know, it's still working on the, uh, it's the book and the film. Nice. Wow. wow. So are you going to karaoke with uh, Jimmy Moore again on the low card? Always, <laughs> always. Is that, that's a recurring theme? That's that's kind of become a thing. We have a couple songs that people always want us to do. Number one being Elvira. So it's just uh, just become part of our our shtick. I, I figured you more for a Beatles guy. Oh, I love the Beatles, but uh, you know, there's only two of us up there when we do this. So uh, oh, that would be four. That there would you go. be four. Well, you'll, actually, you'll, I take it back. Eric Westman got up with us a couple times to do uh, Twist and Shout. So, yeah, <laughs> we've, we've worked a little Beatles in there, too. And you've got to see Eric do Twist and Shout. I mean, come on. <laughs> that, that, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, and well, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of that whole, uh, does he kind of harpen back to the you know, Chicago and the the parade and do the whole thing with the, the float, really get into it. Well, you lost me there. Chicago parade. Oh, well, it's out from a movie. Forget it. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that down. A rabbit. We'll forget about that rabbit hole. So instead, why don't you, why don't you tell me about the fathead kids? I've got uh, two, two little ones and uh, I saw that you have a, a new book. Well, I guess it's not that new, right? It's, it's, it's new enough. Um, it's called fat head kids. And the subtitle is stuff about diet and health. I wish I knew when I was your age. And that's exactly what it's about because, uh, I was the fat kid with the skinny arms and legs, slowest kid in class. And I was not born to be a great athlete. I don't have those genetics, but when I made fat head and changed my diet and there I was pushing 50 years old when I did it, and I became a much leaner, stronger, more energetic person. And I looked back and I thought, I did not have to be that kid. That was the result of diet. So the point of Fathead Kids is to tell people who are kids now, here's what I wish someone had explained to me when I was your age. Here's how those grains and sugars affect you. Here's why certain foods, you young guys, will give you boy boobs. Here's why getting fat is not about, oh, you're just consuming too many calories. It's about the chemical signals that you're getting from the foods you eat. And we tried to do it all in a very fun, cartoony way. um, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, that's some pretty serious topics. How do you try to boil that down for kids? Because I actually, I don't have a copy of the book. I went went earlier to... Uh, but it's definitely one of those things I, I, I can't believe I didn't see, I didn't find it earlier. So what we do is we, we create an analogy for the body, which is a starship called the Nautilus. And basically we explain how the body works in terms of you are a biological starship. We're going to call the Nautilus. And much of what it does is run by, software. It's run by apps. 
uh, you have the security app and you have the energy app and all that. And then the, a lot of what's going on in there is explained by two characters who are crew members of the Nautilus. One is called Mr. Spot, who looks like a dog and explains a lot of the science. And another is called Dr. Fishbones, who explains kind of how this stuff affects you medically. And then an awful lot of what they are talking about is how the ship's the ship's chief engineer, a guy called Marty Metabolism, how he keeps the ship running and how so much of what he does is respond to commands that are sent to him by the food you eat. So it's this kind of cartoony, sort of Star Trek-y, fun way of explaining it. We put a lot of uh, little bits of humor in there. I always tried to work humor into anything I do and tried to explain it as absolutely simply as we could so that adolescents would get it. And what's been really satisfying for me is the number of adults who have read it and have gotten in touch and said, I'm so glad you explained this at an adolescent level because now I get it. Yeah, so this was yeah. this was a joint effort, correct? Oh, absolutely. This is a... Uh, I did the writing and my wife did the drawing. I mean, I tend to think in words and my wife tends to think in pictures because I'm a writer and she's an artist. So an awful lot of what made this book what it is, is her taking the things I was explaining and then coming up with cartoons that make it perfectly crystal clear what's going on. So she drew all these different sections of the ship. She drew all these characters. She did a phenomenal job, in my humble opinion. Were you, were your kids part of this process as well? They were in that when I would write something up and my wife would do a couple of simple drawings um, before putting in the color and all that, we'd have my daughters read it and say, does this make sense? Do you understand what we're saying here? And nice. if they said no, we'd go back and revisit it and try to simplify it again. So if you don't mind me asking, how old are your kids? Uh, uh, the younger one is 12, the older one's 14, but they were probably two years younger when we were doing the writing. Uh, that's, so they would have been more, more like 10 <laughs> and 12 at the time. Yeah, it's like a sweet spot. I mean, that's kind of where my kids are. And I've I got to be honest, I, I struggle with trying to boil it down. So I, I think that's a fantastic concept and idea. Are there any plans to make that digital or, or to make it into a movie? I, I actually am making it into a, into an animated film. Um, I'm most of the way done, in fact. So we took exactly the same characters that my wife had drawn for the book, and I went through some online courses on animating in Adobe After Effects and had my wife break up those characters into pieces parts. And I'm fortunate to have two nephews who are both actually pretty good actors. Um, they do community theater and whatnot, and they did uh, most of the voiceover work for me, made the characters come to life. So when it's all together, it's going to be most of the topics that are in the book with the characters moving and talking and the stuff that happens in the ship, you're actually seeing it happen in the ship. So again, I, I think it's going to be a really fun way for kids to wrap their heads around this stuff because it is hard to explain. It's hard to explain this stuff to adults. But if you can get it down to a cartoony kid level, then people who otherwise struggle to get these concepts, they, they finally are able to wrap their heads around it. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. You, you, you seem to tend to like dive in and get your hands dirty when you have these things. You didn't just come up with the idea and give the you know, manuscript over to some other company. Is, is that something you've always done, just do dove in yourself? Yeah, I like, to, I like to make sure that if I'm going to do something like a film, that I'm involved top to bottom so that it comes out the way I want. And also, I mean, as far as things like, well, I'd never shot a documentary before or I've never animated cartoons before. Something I'm constantly emphasizing with my daughters is nobody's born knowing anything. So, well, gee, I don't know how to make a documentary. Well, 
at one time, the people making documentaries didn't know how to make documentaries either. The people who animate cartoons weren't born knowing that they had to learn. So I've always kind of had the attitude, if you say, gee, I'd like to know how to animate cartoons, well, then learn to animate. Everybody who does it had to learn. So there's a lot of elbow grease and time involved, but it's very satisfying when you finish a process like that and you, you have a skill you didn't used to have. So when you, uh, you said you were almost done, is, is, that, is there a, like a release date planned or... We do not have an official release date. Um, it's, it's kind of the type of thing, since I'm doing the animating, I'm composing the music, I'm editing the thing myself. It's kind of one of those, it'll be done when it's done type of things. But I gave a half promise, put it that way, to Jimmy Moore that I'd have a final version ready to show on the cruise in May. <laughs> so that's that's kind of my self-imposed deadline. I really want to have this done by May. And then uh, we fortunately, um, we already know who our distributor will be because um, without getting into a whole lot of history, the first two distributors for Fathead turned out to be either incompetent or in one case, just flat out crooks. And we never did get paid. And it wasn't until we found the distributor we are with now, Gravitas, that we actually started getting paid for all those people who were buying and watching Fathead around the world. Oh, my God. So now we have a distributor that we know, we like, we trust, and we have, you know, we're not going to mess around with getting burned again. We're going to go straight to them. So I also saw out on your website that you took a crack at Fathead Kids Club. It looks like you you didn't go that direction. Did was that was that just a you were diving in see if it would stick and just decided not to not to follow through with it or? There was never a decision not to follow through. My daughters were interested in being part of this process, so we had them do these little videos where I'd kind of write it and then they would perform it. And we'd edit it and put it together, and they enjoyed doing it. And we got nice feedback from people on those. But then being kids, I mean, they got involved with things like piano lessons and schoolwork and all kinds of other stuff. And it just got to where they didn't really have time. I didn't really have time. So without ever making a decision, you know, oh, we're going to stop doing that. We just kind of stopped because we, we just all got too busy to, to keep it going. It takes a while to put a good video together. Yeah, they, they I, I, it was a really cute premise, and that them doing the interviewing was, I, I think it was a, it was definitely, a, I would, like you said, you got positive feedback. I could totally understand that. And full disclosure, I owned the domain name primalparents.com for like five years and never did any, anything with it. So you got farther than I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> at least you, at least you produced some. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I wish we had had endless time. Um, I, I, of course, they're my daughters, so I'm biased. I think they're adorable. I, I enjoyed watching them do these, uh, and I would have loved to have done more. But uh, it was just one of those things. There are only so many hours in a week. No, no, we uh, we totally understand that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, so John and I, you know, we work corporate America, and we do this in addition to our job. Um, so... I'm assuming that you have a daytime job and that you do um, stand up com- stand up comedy if you still do that and and this as your ten percent or whatever um, it, is that I mean do you do still the comedy and no actually I gave up the stand up comedy um, when my daughters came along because to make a living as a stand up comic unless you are on television or in movies or whatever, to make a living as a stand-up comic, you travel a lot. I mean, I used to do stand-up on cruise ships. I would have these cruise ship gigs that might last two weeks, five weeks, whatever. And when my daughters came along, uh, the older one especially, who's kind of always been a daddy's girl, it kind of got to her, it was bothering her that when I was gone for three, four, five weeks at a time. And I didn't want to be that guy who was gone for half the childhood. So... I just decided it's time to give up the stand up and it was a little painful to do at the time, but in retrospect, it worked out well because 
that's part of what inspired me to come up with this idea for shooting that series in defense of common sense, which ultimately led to Fathead. I was thinking, okay, I want to do something creative and kind of funny, but it, it can't involve traveling for weeks at a time. Well, then I'm going to shoot something on my own. So as far as I'm concerned, that all worked out for the best. But as far as a day job, yes, until the book or the film or whatever sell amazingly well, um, I'm keeping the, the day job for now. And the day job is I'm a software engineer. Okay. I, th- I thought you were in IT as well. That's what John yeah. and I yeah, yeah. work in. Um, so I'm sure you've planned for retirement. Is, is being a health advocate part of that plan? Part of my retirement plan? Yeah. Like when you, when you leave corporate America, is, is that, I mean, let's just say that you have to continue until you can retire. Um, Mm -hmm. is, is being a healthcare advocate, is that, like, I mean, are, are you planning to keep pursuing this space? I will, I'll absolutely keep pursuing it. I mean, um, Fathead, you know, did eventually, like I said, we had issues with our first two distributors, but once we got in the hands of the right distributor, it finally did become a profitable venture. And if I end up retiring from IT, I would continue doing the type of thing I'm, I'm doing with the books and the films. And I mean, honestly, if the book, that we, you know, it's still fairly new out there. The film is yet to go. If they went great guns and it, that replaced the, uh, the paycheck, then I'd probably let the paycheck go. Nice. So, uh, just to, I guess, I don't want to say wrap it up, but, but if you could, somebody's listening to this and they haven't really kind of got the, you know, you're in an elevator with them. They've never heard of your movie. What, what are the, I guess the, the five or six, quick bullet points that you always pitch when you're, you're introducing it just to kind of give somebody a summary. Well, let's see, 30 second elevator speech. Uh, I would, I would start with saying, by the way, most of the dietary advice you get from the government, the American heart association, et cetera, is not correct. It was never based on science. It was based on politics and it was based on financial arrangements with the makers of, industrial foods. Damn, now you would go straight for the jugular, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, Open and up with the stock and on. That's right. You know, I want them to think I'm crazy before I even continue. <laughs> so then I would say, uh, now that you understand, or I hope you understand that the current dietary guidelines are not based on science, here are the three things you can do to vastly improve your health. Number one, stop eating sugar. Number two, stop eating processed grains, the breads, the cereals, et cetera, that are supposed to be so healthy for you. You're not. And number three, stop eating industrial oils, the soybean oils, the cottonseed oils, all these quote unquote vegetable oils, most of which are actually seed oils, were never part of the human diet until industrial processing made them possible. They are not natural foods. Your body doesn't know what to do with them. The fats you are supposed to be eating are the ones created by God and Mother Nature. Animal fats and the fats that can be squeezed directly from foods like olives and coconuts. Well, I think you went a little over the elevator ride, but I think those are those are are fantastic three points. And I mean, uh, I mean, I I know you. We don't. uh, don't exactly. I mean, you're not. You don't ever advocate like a particular diet or anything. You just go you go for those from from a particular guideline perspective. I, I think that's a fantastic idea to kind of leave out the trendy topics, the fad diets. You just set all that aside and just give them those three action items. I, I think those are the the big the big rocks anyway, for lack of a better term. Well, I think so too, and you know. I'm not opposed to ketogenic, you know, a very specific low carb diet. I mean, your show is called Ketonian Corner. I'm not opposed to that, but maybe the way I differ from some low carbers is I don't think you absolutely must be on a ketogenic diet or you're not going to be healthy. I consider a ketogenic diet one way of being healthy. It could be a paleo diet that's not necessarily ketogenic. It doesn't even for some people have to be a particularly low carb diet, as long as they cut out the three, uh, 
you know, triggers of bad health that I mentioned. To me, most people, if they just do those three things, they're going to wildly improve their health if they're currently eating a standard American diet. And then, then it becomes down to you can get that last 20% of the benefit or whatever by finding out specifically what works for you. Is it ketogenic? Is it paleo with maybe a few more carbs in the form of tubers or things like that? You know, there's no one diet that's absolutely correct for everyone. Yeah, and, we, and we've talked about that before. We've talked about carb sensitivity and trying to find your, your sweet spot and a lot of different things like that. So we, we, do, uh, we do completely understand what you're saying, and, and I love the fact that you're, you're talking about finding out what you know, is the best for them. So is there anything uh, that we've gl- glossed over that you want to bring up that we may have, uh, we may have missed? Uh, you know, unless you want to ask me how my disc golf game is going, I'd say we pretty much got it covered. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you do a uh, disc golf, huh? Well, one of the joys of living on this land is I, I put my own disc golf course on it. So, uh, yeah, yes, I do. Well, I do. we definitely have something in common then. Uh, my, my backyard is there's a, it's actually called a sportsman's club. It's not really, it's more of a, a pond and fisherman stuff and it's got disc golf. So I've got a set for my kids, and we walk out the backyard and go over there and throw, throw the discs around. So I am not uh, – I totally understand what you're talking about. Yeah, so, was, uh, I used to play the, real ball golf, you know, which was, of course, a very expensive uh, habit to get into. And, you know, now – what I mean, what's a good disc? 15 20 bucks. So <laughs> I find this very satisfying, and it costs almost nothing. So how many discs do you carry when you go? Do you actually have different weights and do the whole entire full out thing? I carry four. I carry four discs. I've found I, I really don't need more than that. I, I basically have three drivers, one of which, assuming I throw the way I should throw, one basically goes straight, one starts straight, bends left, the other starts straight, bends right. So I have those for those situations. And then I found that my mid-range makes a perfectly fine putter, so I don't bother carrying a putter. So I'm, I don't, I'm not one of those who carries the bag of 14 discs or whatever. I just grab my four and out I go. <laughs> well, you know, four, four is not a, not a slouch. So what's your longest, no. uh, what's your longest uh, distance for your, since you put the course in yourself? Uh, uh, the longest hole? Yeah. I think I actually did measure these at one time to decide what par should be. I think we've got one that's about 600 feet. I, I, I struggle, man. The farther away I am, the, the man, I just, I'm all over the place. So you must have a better uh, wrist snap than me. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a huge driver. I mean, I, I've watched these guys online and they throw these, you know, 300, 400 foot drives. No, 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 no. That's great. You know, for, 20 somethings who were actually athletes. I've actually measured like if I absolutely kill a drive and I mean, absolutely kill it. My best drive of the month, it's like 250 feet, but I'm pretty good at, I'm pretty good at, well, you know, for an old guy like me, it's pretty good, but I, I score pretty decently. The reason being, I generally do throw it in the direction I was aiming, which in any kind of golf, of course, is the, is more important than pure distance. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Accuracy is definitely more important than the, than how yeah. far. Because you know, being yeah. able to throw it 400 doesn't matter if it's in the wrong, in the wrong direction. <laughs> so no, I know we spent yeah. we spent so much time talking about health and food and eating. As I, I never we never even bothered to ask you what your activity or your fitness kind of routine is. Well, playing disc golf's part of it. Um, normally, I lift weights at. Uh, on a, at a gym once a week, I do kind of Fred Hahn's slow burn program. I had to stop that in November because I had to have surgery to repair a torn bicep uh, in my left arm. So I was forbidden from doing any of that. And they're just now getting me back to where I can do some exercise. But normally I would lift weights once a week. I play a lot of disc golf. Um, I have a treadmill. I'll get on that for an hour and watch, say, informational videos I've been meaning to catch up on. And we do own this land. And when we're out there, uh, 
with our building projects and clearing the jungle projects and tilling the land projects, I get a lot of good, hard physical exertion on those weekends just because going out and working on the farm, you know, takes some effort. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, that sounds about like something I would support. The lift heavy once a week is definitely a recommendation we've given a lot. And the, uh, we, I, I, I call it fitness fun, which is the playing disc golf, going hiking with the kids and those type of things. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I know you never mentioned your farm, but just out of, out of curiosity, about, about how much of uh, your food do you grow yourself? There, it, it, it varies. Uh, a couple years ago, we actually raised two hogs and then had them slaughtered, and that gave us, I don't know, like 500 pounds of, of uh, meats. So during that period afterwards, I would sit down for dinner some nights and look at my plate and realize almost everything on it came off the land. Uh, but we finally finished up with that. We haven't raised any new meat sources. So the, whatever meats are on the plate now, you know, are coming from the grocery store. But we eat a lot of vegetables during the season that my wife grows. Um, we have chickens. I eat a lot of eggs. Those, of course, come from our own chickens. So a, a fair bit of what we eat comes comes right off the land. Yeah, that, that farm to farm to table is a great concept, but it's it's a lot more work than people think it is. You know, it is work, but I, I realized when my wife started growing more of our vegetables, when we started eating eggs off our from our own flock, so many people remember their grandmother or great grandmother or whatever being an awesome cook. And yes, she probably was, but. When my wife brings in tomatoes off the land or, char or kale that she grew herself and you bite into it, the flavor just pops yeah. because it wasn't, you know, the foods that are sold in the grocery stores, the produce, they aren't necessarily bred for flavor. They're bred for durability so they can be shipped across the country. And the stuff that comes off the land, it just, the flavor just absolutely pops. And I realized I think a lot of that memory people have of grandma being a great cook was because grandma was serving foods that already tasted great because they came off the land. Yeah. Yeah. Very jealous. I, I, yeah, I totally agree. And I, although I don't have my own chickens, uh, we do have two acres and we do, uh, thanks to my mother, uh, do have quite a bit of a garden. So. Well, I definitely took the end of this uh, this, this interview off off topic, uh, much like my Ferris Bueller's Day Off reference earlier. Uh, so we'll go ahead and and wrap it up. So I, again, I, I know we went a little over on time, but I really appreciate you just uh, sharing with us. I know we're all just trying to kind of get our stories out and and try to help that you know other people just pick up those nuggets and it and it lets them. I think you what would you call it earlier? You just felt felt a whole bunch better is that what were what were your words there you just felt better uh i don't remember but yes i i absolutely feel better i'm leaner stronger healthier more energetic now and i'm going to turn 60 in november by the way than i was 30 years ago and that i know comes down to the diet which is why i'm always emphasizing to people especially young people if i had known at your age, what I can tell you now, you're going to have a much better life. So that's the message I'm always trying to put out there. Wow. Just let that sink in. 30 years different, and you yeah. feel better now than you did 30. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's saying something, that's for sure. Amazing. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. It has been a pleasure. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, too. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Don't forget, uh, you can always head out. We're uh, Ketonian Corner on all of the socials and ketoniancorner.com if you want the show notes. And uh, we'll have a links to the book and all of the social uh, that Tom's got. And, uh, again, uh, if you haven't uh, watched the movie yet, you definitely have to, you have to get, give it a view. Thanks. Talk to you next week. Thank <laughs> you.